Welcome to Smart Branding, a podcast dedicated to branding, naming, and domain names. I'm Tatiana Bonneau, and with my guests, we try to help you create and grow strong, memorable, and meaningful brands online. I believe time is one of our most precious assets, and so I want to thank you in advance if you decide to spend the next 30 minutes with us. I promise to do my best to make those worth it. Let's go. So hello, and welcome to the, this episode of Smart Branding Podcast. Today, I'm excited to have Dennis Litley, a classically trained chef with over 40 years of experience. Uh, Dennis also has developed a very strong personal brand. He has uh, his website, a blog with recipes that can help anyone, uh, well, anyone I hope anyone, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to get to that because I'm like really hopeless in the kitchen. So I'm going to have some questions on that as well. He has a huge following online. He's been featured in a lot of top publications for uh, food blogs and also has been a guest in a lot of TV and radio shows. Hi, and thank you for making the time, Dennis. Lovely to have you with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Tatiana. I'm happy to be here today. So let's start classically with a bit of background. How how did you get to cook? And, and like, was that a aha moment when you were little? How did that all happen? The, the earliest memory of me cooking, I think I was around three or four maybe oh. there was getting a, a step stool out and putting frozen waffles into a toaster. <laughs> <laughs> so how did that work out? <laughs> well, I, ne- I didn't know about turning the toaster on, but oh, uh, that's good. <laughs> okay, so I was, I was not quite at that level of expertise yet, but I do remember eating them frozen anyway. So it really must not have been that bad, but that was one of my earliest memories. I'm going to interrupt you here because I, I have, I, and I, I, that's embarrassing, but I wasn't even that little because just now I had that flashback. I was probably like six, I think. And I put a piece of bread in a toaster that had butter on it and it burst into flames. Yeah. So yeah, don't do that. I think yours was better. <laughs> I think I had that happen too. And I, I was probably older than that at that point. But, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, but now that, that was my first thing. You know, honestly, um, I love to eat. You know, I was, my, my, my mother said I was a little round boy, she used to say, you know, and uh, my grandmother used to love feeding me. My grandmother was Mexican and uh, she mm. would just take great joy in just feeding me until I would just stop, which took a long, <laughs> took a long time. Uh, but I, I always connected the fact that if I could get in the kitchen and do something, that meant I could eat, you know, or eat quickly. <laughs> Okay. My mom was a nurse and she worked nights. So I tried to let her sleep. I, I was horrible to that poor woman. I woke her up constantly. I really feel bad about that. But uh, <laughs> I, I would I would get on my bike and I'd ride to the store and I'd buy stuff. I'd, I'd collect bottles. And that's when we used to turn bottles in for, for the deposit, you know, mm. which is something we should get back to so we don't waste yeah. some glass. Uh, but I would get the money and I'd buy a box of pasta or, or maybe a can of tomatoes or something. And I'd go back and try and make something. And, you know, and uh, right away I connected that and the joy of eating is what fuels my joy of cooking. Um, mm. and then back in the sixties, that's how old, you know, I wanted to put 50 years of experience, but that made me sound really, really old. So I put <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Back in the 60s, there was a guy called Graham Kerr, and he was the galloping gourmet. And at this time, we had no TV chefs. There were no personalities. There were, there was Julia Child, and we did not appreciate her at the time. She was a housewife, you know, cooking. Mm-hmm. And, and, oh, yeah. The, the, and that, that was all we had. So, and it wasn't something. So here comes this man on the screen wearing a scarf and ascot with an Aussie accent, drinking wine. And, you know, I was, <laughs> 12 or 13. I wasn't really interested in the wine, but he was having so much fun and he would cook and he'd tell his stories and he'd bring people down from the audience at the end to taste it. And they were literally moaning when they ate the food. <laughs> so this resonated with me. This was in the back of my mind, you know, and then, you know, as a young man, I, I went through all different types of jobs, trying to find something that fit me, a master, jack of all trades, master of none, until I finally decided to go into a kitchen and start working and start training. And mm. uh, that, was, that was where I was meant to be. That was where I was always happy, no matter how bad my day was, no matter what was going on in my life, I could forget it all and just put myself into cooking and create food and make other people happy. So by making other people happy, I was fulfilling myself. Yeah, so mm. that, that was really how I kind of started. And, you know, just over the years, just 
moving to different restaurants, uh, teaching. I, I started my last job was at an all girls high school. I was going to take it. And the principal said, well, you work 165 days a year. And I was getting ready to turn her down at that point. And when she said, that, <laughs> when would you like me to start? <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so that was that was the beginning of that. And then it was a new chapter in my life. It kind of revitalized me. And I started, um, I decided I wanted to teach again. I wanted to help the girls. It was an all girls high school, help them learn how to cook. I didn't want to turn them into chefs. I just wanted them to be able to feed their families. So I started a culinary program at the school, which turned out to be like one of the most successful things the school ever had. And mm -hmm. it, everyone likes to eat and girls love to eat as much as boys do, especially when there's no <laughs> boys around. They can really eat then. They don't have to pretend. <laughs> <laughs> they'd, they'd curse me. They'd come in and go, damn you, Dennis. And thank you. And they'd take the food from me. You know? <laughs> hey, um, cool. But it was, it was good. So that started my blogging career. I started it as a resource for my students and none of them ever mm. really went to it. They just wanted to talk to me personally. But uh, the other students in the school would go there. Teachers would go there. And I found out about being a blogger. And this is where I kind of reinvented myself. And at that time, it just fueled my desire for cooking even more because I joined a group called Food Buzz that was out of San Francisco. And we had, there were people all over the world. I mean, there were bloggers from every place on the planet that had internet at the time and could post. And I was seeing all these dishes and going, oh my God, that is incredible. What is it? And, you know, and I was, I was trying and the, and the girls were like a blank camp. They didn't care what I fed them. They were just so happy to have, <laughs> have you know, not school food. We definitely were not school food and uh, <laughs> they would eat anything I would put out there. Uh, so it was a really good thing. And, and when I finally had to retire from all the injuries I suffered over the years of cooking, you know, my back, my hands, my shoulders, everything was going. Mm. I kind of went into a depression. We moved to Florida and that helped a lot because sunshine and blue skies really do a lot for depression and uh, started started blogging more. And I think right before we left, Google Plus started. And that was mm. one of those platforms that was a love-hate rel or hate relationship. You didn't, <laughs> there was no middle ground. And I loved it. They were my people. I, I drank the Kool-Aid with both hands. I was, I was <laughs> in for everything. And um, Google started rewarding me for being one of their power users in the area in Philadelphia. That's when I was living there. Mm. And um, they, they had me on the follow list with Anthony Bourdain, Martha Stewart, Rachel Ray, Emerald Lagasse. And I'm going, how the hell did this happen? But, you know, I, I wrote it for all it was worth. And I started to build some prominence and I started to speak at conferences. It, it helped. And I, they, they really liked what I was doing because I was doing their hangouts. And this was a time when no one was live streaming. And it was mm. very difficult to live stream. It was like, and with Google Plus, it was like their hangouts. It was all these things could happen. You had to be ready for. And sometimes they all happened at the same time. <laughs> you, know, you were like beside yourself. So that taught me how to adapt, how to, and it helped my public speaking greatly because I was horrible when I started. So that really helped me move my brand in another direction and that rebranded. Mm. And during the course of this, I was always trying to help other people because knowledge was not being readily shared in the early days. Uh, the bloggers that had all the power wanted to keep all the power. Mm. So they never told us, they never shared it. They'd allow us to take a picture with us, with them, and then they'd be peon, be gone now. Okay. <laughs> So I would share everything I learned. And then one day somebody said, you know, you should be asked Chef Dennis. I'm like, really? Mm. Hey, everybody asks you things. You you answer them. <laughs> That's just who you are. So it became like the most important branding decision I ever made in my life because mm. I was my brand. And at that time, people were afraid to show their faces. For, I, I don't know for what reason. And one of the things that Google mm. addressed was people do business with people. And I knew this from being in the kitchens. I, I ordered food from people I liked. Mm. I didn't like you unless you really had a good product that I needed. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't going to make time for you. Uh, mm. And if, if I didn't like you, I would call it in so I didn't have to see you. You know, it was that kind of, <laughs> people do business with people they like, people they trust, people they form a relationship with. The easiest way to do that was by putting yourself out there, by showing your face, by letting mm. them be the person with the brand. So right away, I did that right. And that's what really 
kind of helped me start the growth. And then through Google Plus, I met people all over the globe that were just brilliant and were my friends and would mm. talk anytime I pinged them online, you know, would come on to my shows. I, at that mm. point, I had three live broadcasts uh, going and they would, you know, if I said, you know, can you be on my show? And one guy was in Greece uh, uh, and he would come on in the middle of the night. He would, he would wake up to be on my show because <laughs> we were <laughs> So that was really what kind of started driving the process. And then it was just staying diligent. And the one thing I learned was when you're starting something, your competitors, if you really allow them to be and be your best friends, mm. because you're doing the same business, there's enough business for everyone. You're not in a, a, a business that dictates that you need every last scrap and you have to fight people. Mm. No, there's, there's so much business out there. So if you get with people that think like you do, that have the same problems, that have the same hopes that are trying to build the same type of thing, you know, you can, you can have a very good resource and someone to talk mm. to. Them. So this is what really, Definitely, yeah. yeah, that started this, that really started the growth at that. Yeah. A, a few things there. One is that, um, well, I'm, I'm going to start backwards because I'm, I'm going to forget what I'm thinking otherwise, but on, on that, on the competitors, I, I think that's something that many people and brand owners overlook, be it for the personal brand or for, for their business, um, as you just mentioned, I mean, especially when you're, when I mean, you're, you're not working on a small street in a small town, you know, the, you're on, on the internet. There's so many people. There's so many, uh, like you, you, you have a blog about food. There's so many other blogs about food, but there's so many people, and and you know, somebody might like your style personally. Somebody might like the style of you know how you cook or what you cook. Or there's different niches in what you do, types of food. There's so many things that it's just really not needed to uh, feel like you have to be against somebody or hide something. It, it, yeah, I really love the way that you kind of embrace that competition more, and you see it more as a cooperation. Because oh, you're yeah. in the same boat, effectively. Yeah, someone had told me long ago that a rising tide raises all boats. So I, I always kind of mm. like that philosophy. And it also, you know, you can be you can be really competitive with a friend because you can have fun mm. with it. You know, and you oh, can, yeah. you can laugh about it. You can you can joke about it. You know, and it's it, while increasing your business. Where if you don't know that person, well, that kind of takes some of you know. You're still growing your business, but if you can have fun while you're doing it, put some joy into what you're doing mm. and, and your creativity, and you're helping someone else. He's helping you, mm. and you know, everything just kind of it's a, it's a better environment to work in. It's not something that you have to then dread working or you mm. have to try and be secretive or, you know, it, it, it opens up things for you and mm. it channels a lot of positive energy. So it reminds me of sports. I, I, I do, I, I do mountain running and up until very recently, I was the only girl in the club. And just recently there was another girl and everybody was like, Oh, competition. I'm like, no, I, I love that. You know, that that's so much more yeah. motivational. And I have somebody who actually, we have a lot more in common and a lot more common issues and we're more like on the same level. And it's been just beneficial in, in every possible way. It's, oh, it's brilliant. Absolutely. absolutely. I, I mean, I remember I always hear stories you see where someone's running and the runner gets disoriented mm. and almost getting ready. I read one recently and the guy that was coming behind him went to him and straight mm. out and let him finish ahead of him. And they said, why did you do that? Mm. You I said, and he said, yeah, my mother have thought if I had done that, mm. that was the answer. It's like she would have been ashamed of me for winning that. Yeah. Night. Yeah. So. Yeah, and 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 what sort of win is that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and winning yeah. at all costs is not is not the answer. You know, winning is mm. great. I mean, that's why they keep score. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if you have to win because you did something to someone else to get there. You know, and and that's the same mm. philosophy in sports as it is in business. If you mm. are successful because you beat someone down or you did something unethical, mm. that's going to come back to you. You know, karma's a bitch. You know, and it can come back to yeah. you. Yeah. Definitely, <laughs> seeing that happen. Uh, so on, <laughs> on the other, on the other point, because um, we we touched on how effectively Ask Chef Dennis came to you as a as a brand name, as opposed to you actually having to. Oh, what am I going to call myself now? And uh, you secured the matching domain name, and you mentioned Google Plus, which, if I'm not mistaken, doesn't exist anymore, does it? Oh, no. um, yeah. So that is something that. Um, I so like you, you do have a huge following like on Instagram, on different social media, but 
everything, like all the recipes, you point to your website. And, and that's something that I, I would like you to expand a little bit on, but like just for, for our audience and any uh, personal brand owners, bloggers, aspiring bloggers, I see a lot of people that get carried away with, oh, I'm just going to do it on Instagram. Some don't even have a website. Like, I'm just going to do my thing on Instagram. And it's, I find that it's so much um, like you're putting all of your eggs in one basket that you don't even know no. in a way. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, that is, that is so important. And people get so caught up on it. And I, I see them, I'm in, in forums all the time and different, you know, trying to help or, or learn at the same time. And people will say, oh, when Pinterest went crazy, when Pinterest, hmm. Pinterest was like fueling so much business for a while. And, and it's a funny story. When Pinterest first came out, I got this invitation to it. I thought, what the hell is this? This is spam. I put this. <laughs> and then like a month later, I'm hearing all this stuff and I'm begging for another invite, begging for another <laughs> Another three months to get invited into it. Uh, but, you know, you, like you said, you can't depend on someone else's business to make, to create business for you right? and to push business. Mm. To, it's great while it lasts. And we've seen this over the years of all the different social medias that have come and gone. The ones we have now, I think, have kind of got it pretty well. But, you know, Facebook keeps trying to, to kill itself, you know, with all the changes. <laughs> You know, it's like, yeah. you know, nobody likes Facebook anymore. They can call <laughs> themselves Meta. They can call themselves Dave. I don't care. You know, but, but they're still <laughs> they're sucking big time right now. But we use them because it's a way to reach people. And mm. it's, it's part of business. But depending on them to drive traffic to you, not a good idea. And I tell people, mm. that all, there's only one thing out there that you need to trust and you need to work towards and work for what they want. And that's Google, because right now Google is the God of search and mm. you have to appease them. You have to do what they want. And the traffic that's coming in then is, is going to be more uh, organic. That's what you want organic, mm. traffic, you know, but social media, people that have one account, one of the things that, that really built my business, why I just found out I could be a travel blogger. Uh, if I wrote, yeah, somebody had me go to a hotel and they put me up in the third floor of the last room they had. And it wasn't a great floor, but I had nine foot sliding glass doors that opened to the ocean. Mm. And I'm standing there going, oh, they gave me this for free because I'm writing about it. And this is when mm. I was making a lot of money as a blogger. And I'm going, <laughs> people will send me all over the place. So that's what happened. People started sending me all over the world for free. I was having the time of my life mm. uh, writing about it. But the thing I forgot during that was that I, that food was what was paying all the bills. Travel was mm. okay. So yeah. it was a lesson learned. And the pandemic reminded me that I liked to cook, which was a good thing because mm. I couldn't go out. But uh, social media, having all these different social media outlets and a blog, when I became a travel blogger, I was blowing travel bloggers away that had been blogging for, had been a travel in, influencer. They weren't really bloggers. Mm influencers because some of them didn't have blogs some of their blogs mm. were so ugly you wouldn't even want to do it. <laughs> you know uh and their social media accounts weren't even that great mm. but they were they were living off of selling articles for 25 dollars mm. of this publication you know 100 dollars of this publication they were so i'd come out i get over a million followers i'm getting mm. that I got one company over a million impressions on one campaign i did for them and they were they were like they couldn't believe they had never mm. seen like that. So, you know, and then I started teaching travel blockers how to do this. I'm going, you guys, I started speaking at, at con travel conferences going, you guys got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do this, you know, and trying to get them to raise their standards a little and, and mm. let them understand that all these different little small outlets they have that's bringing them business really isn't dependable. And they mm. need to start writing for Google. They need to start developing a plan to have organic traffic driven to their blogs, because as we've all seen, you know, the, the magazine outlets, the newspaper outlets, everything's changed and mm. how to write is everything's changed. So they're, they're not making any money. Their, their jobs are drying up. So by expanding their brand and finding what will make them more fluid and more, uh, and, and get a bigger part of the, of the picture uh, has been mm. important. Each. So, you know, a brand is about everything that's out there. So when mm. a new social media comes out, I apply right away and I get my name. Mm. Someone else doesn't get mm. it. And that way 
if I do decide he's like, I have an account on TikTok. I think I have five. <laughs> My granddaughter keeps going yelling at me because you, she says, you got to start posting. I says, I don't like doing that. You know, I, don't <laughs> I like know, doing that. I know. I, don't, I did that sort of thing. I, kind of, I think I still, I don't know if uh, it hasn't been deactivated my account. It's, it's like every new thing. But I, I think the important thing there is you have your domain name, your blog, your personal brand. The rest of it is like tools and it should be used and seen as that, but it's not your, like Instagram is not your business. Facebook is not your business. And I see that and I find it absolutely mind boggling that people would like, they would pay even for, to drive traffic to Instagram or to Facebook. And I'm like, are you crazy? Like why, why? I mean, especially if you're paying, if you're not, you know, getting it for free, like why don't you drive them to your website? <laughs> you know, what's the, what's the point? Be- Again, it's it's like they don't know how to set the website up, or they get they get fooled into believing. You know, there's so many new options out. You know, like there's different mm. types of websites now that have started that really like if you're a food blogger, they're horrible for food. You know, if you have mm. an Etsy business, you know they might work really good for them. But depending mm-hmm. on the industry that you're in, and a travel blogger would fall on the same thing. You you need a WordPress blog. You know, it's plain and simple. You know, if you want Google. Mm mind you. That's what you need. I started out on Blogger and that's owned by Google. So I'm thinking, mm. why isn't Blogger like the number one blogging? Mm. But it was, it never was. It would just didn't work right. It was again, something that Google built that really that wasn't where their emphasis was. They were a search <laughs> engine company and uh, we'll do that, but we don't really care about it. <laughs> and that's what happened. Yeah. With Plus, it was, it was the grand experiment. They kind of labeled it as, mm. uh, but people don't understand the importance of having a blog. As, as you know, a website it doesn't have to be a blog, but your business mm. website. And then some people spend a fortune getting it built by so called experts that have no clue what they're doing. They can build a website. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they can build a website and it might be pretty. Half the time it isn't, but it has no functionality and it does mm. not do what Google wants it to do. So you've got this website that no one's ever going to find because no one's ever mm. going to search for it. And it's not going to. Mm. It, it comes down to uh, actually on that as well, that you, you just uh, mentioned earlier that like you were, you were traveling and you were getting uh, better deals or more interest because you have that huge, huge following and people like influencers are wondering how you do that. I think a huge part of it is actually authenticity. Like you literally, I mean, we've been talking for like what, 20 minutes and from the very beginning, like when you were three or four year old to when and how you discover that that's what you want to do. And that's where you feel happy and to you know all the, it's your life. It's who you are. And that's what you're putting out. And I think you, you cannot buy that you cannot fake that you cannot replace that with you know well i'm gonna buy myself whatever followers and then you know i'm gonna go and get like uh, advertisers or whatever because it, it will it will flop at some point it, it just oh, yeah. will break down yeah and then you're gonna have a mental breakdown when it does because your whole mm. livelihood is going to disappear you know i mm. i was never you know in my younger days maybe but when i'm doing this now i was never pretty enough to really be you know <laughs> that in, that type of influencer you know people will send me things i'm going really you want me to push this for you on instagram <laughs> <laughs> okay but uh, you know it's not and it's it's the beautiful people that always get that type of influence saying you know that's fine i don't have a problem with that but learn some skills too while you're there don't just rely on your physical presence or mm. To do it, you know, you, you, if you want to be successful and contain, continue as a business, there's a lot more to the picture that you have to start learning. And I think that's that's where I've always been benefited from. Uh, now I wanted to say ahead of the curve, but I'm not really ahead of the curve. It's just that I keep current because mm. I'm always interested in seeing what's new. What can I do to fix what I have? And, you know, and that comes down to, to either having friends that really know how to help you or hiring someone. Like I've had mm. four SEO audits on my blog. Mm. Sure, I found a new person for a different set of eyes on it. And that's mm. one thing. They, they help you fix it so it's Google friendly. That's that's one of the terms. I want to, I'm want i speaking on a new topic and it's how to make your blog Google friendly. Mm. Some people just don't understand what it has to be for Google to know who you are, what you're doing. You know, it's got to be in that upper, the, the top third of your posts so they see it. It's got to be something mm. that they recognize. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of other aspects that come into it. And then we were talking about um, working for for someone else, basically. You're working for Facebook. You're working for Instagram. You're driving traffic to them. You're driving traffic mm. to 
business. You don't own any of that. Mm. You know, if they decide to change or shut it down. He'll be in the corner crying because and that's your yeah, business. and that has happened. We've seen that so many oh, times. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Not, and, no. Really, the number one thing that you have, your biggest tool that you can own besides your website is your subscriber list, your email mm, account. Definitely. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. That that direct connection with your audience that, that nobody can take away. You know, like if aliens invade or something, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Unless you can find a way to get them to subscribe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would be cool. And then you'd be galactic. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I uh, had a guest recently, and he specializes in SEO, and I love the way he put it. Um, I'm going to send you the, that episode. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think you'll find it useful because you're kind of, I wouldn't say obsessed with SEO, but you're aware of the importance um, of, and I, I like the way that he put it, um, that you effectively, because before that, actually, before that conversation, even though I've been in tech for quite some time, I've always seen like developers and brand owners running after Google. It's like, what did they do? We have to catch up. What are the, please Google, please Google. And he was saying, no, Google is like a kid. You have to teach it. You know, people go there to search for stuff. And you have to build your content and your personal brand and even your like your own image. You have to present it in a way that it understands what you want to put out there and it's consistent so that when people search for it, it is there and it's presented in the manner that you want it to be presented because it's going to do that anyway. You know, people are going to talk about you or it's going to make its own conclusions. And if you're not working on that, if you're not controlling that narrative, it's not likely going to be what you want it to be. Oh, I, I know. I, I had a lot of friends. The last couple of updates were really aimed at bad content. Mm. And if your content was just fluff. If it didn't do something, if it didn't teach someone something, if it wasn't helpful, if it wasn't authentic, if it was just, you know, if you, and again, it comes down to two. Now, if your images are really horrible, if you're not using the correct uh, words, wording in it, if your, your, your alt text isn't right, if there's so many different parts of it that when you're mm. building this, that if you don't have this right, they consider it poor, bad content. So mm. if your website, and I have, I have a friend, she had, oh, I think she had like almost 2000 recipes on her website and she was getting no traffic because she had so much bad content on it. Mm. And when we first started, it was a different back in 2009. It was the wild, wild west. It was different. <laughs> it was, we were writing articles, telling stories, making crap up, you know, just over <laughs> you know, nobody knew anything. Um, and we that old content either needs to get rewritten or it needs to get mm. told. It needs to go away, you know, because mm. if your if your website has you know twenty percent bad content, that again that's a strike against you. I I don't know what the percentages are. I just made that up, but mm. you know if it's got a certain percentage, if you don't if you're not mostly good content that's providing information and a service, you know again you're you're getting Google's like you're getting a black mark, and that's not a good mm. thing. So you have to be aware of that. And again, everything changes. So, you know, mm. she, she had all the saying and now she's, she doesn't know where to start. She says, have you, had, have you ever had an SEO, SEO audit? And the first question was, well, what's that? And I'm going, mm. yeah. Oh, you've <laughs> yeah. been blogging since 2009. You were with me in the beginning and you have no clue what that is. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, my God. yeah, it, it goes so quickly. You have to absolutely be on top of it. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it's, it's a battle, but again, I look forward to work every morning. I mm. don't, you know, there's days I don't want to do anything and I, I'll check my emails, make sure there's no fire to put out and then I'll just go watch, <laughs> watch Netflix for the day or something, you know, I just, or, or go out somewhere. It's just, it's important to me, but it's not consuming me mm. and enjoying the process. So I might decide to work for a couple hours and at night, or if I get up in the middle of the night and I can't sleep, I'll work for a while because I like it. And it's kind of soothing to me because I'm doing mm. something that's, that's making, it's fulfilling what I do. Mm. Since I can't be in the kitchen really full time anymore, you know, this has replaced that. Mm. You touched on, you, you just mentioned your friend that's been blogging since 2009. And so you've been doing it for quite some time yourself. Yeah. I'm not going to calculate how many years I've got since 2009 because <laughs> for me, it's like, that wasn't that long ago. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> don't, don't judge the numbers. Don't, don't okay. judge the numbers. And, uh, but how has blogging changed? And second question, how has cooking changed? Because I want to, after this question, jump and talk about cooking a little bit. Well, 
blogging has changed a lot, again, because when we started, it wasn't about, I mean, imagery was always important, but it wasn't mm. the main focus of it. When I started in 2009, it, again, it's, it seemed to me, whether that's true or not, but it was about the stories. And at that mm. point, I don't think anybody, there were there was a handful of people that were getting traffic. You know, Google was still really new. I mean, they, they've been around, but they were still figuring things out for themselves too. So to get traffic was like, how, how does that happen? No one really kind of knew, except there were these maybe 10, 15 bloggers that were at the top echelon and there was no middle ground. There was the, the mm. very, very top and the very, very bottom. And we were all the rest of us were at the very, very bottom and <laughs> trying to figure out how to, how to get up there. You know, and now there's so many different levels of, of, of you know, micro influencers, uh, you know, uh, major influencer, all different things that you get because of the different traffic. But it's changed a lot with the fact we were telling stories, we weren't emphasizing pictures, and then all of a sudden imagery became really important. So then mm. that worked in, and then no one you keep saying, all right. I don't care how your grandmother walked up a mountain to pick these herbs for the dish. <laughs> you know, just give me the damn recipe. So then it, it changed. Okay. And then again, that's a bit sad. I that, know, isn't it? Yeah. You know, there's oh. still people that appreciate that. And, and I will throw, I will try to throw a little tidbit in or if there's something really relevant and, and I don't care who complains because I'm writing it. It's my blog. If you don't like it, <laughs> it's you know, you know, uh, I, you know, just and I always tell them, you know, there is a jump to recipe button at the top of the page. You don't want to mm. read it. That's fine. Just go to the recipe. You know, yeah. I'll at least get a little bit of ad revenue from from you going to the recipe. <laughs> That's OK. Um, but, but yeah, it's changed from that. And now it, it's again, it's writing. I don't want to say you're writing for Google because but basically that's what you're doing. There is mm. a format now of how you kind of have to set it up. And it always changes because Google, again, is trying to improve search. They're looking for new ways to find the best content, the most authentic content and people, mm. uh, content that's really answering the questions people are looking for. So they mm. keep analyzing other people for not doing that. You know, the big the big brouhaha now is AI, mm. AI. Because there's these AIs uh, and I've tried them and they write this content. I'm going, wow. Mm. wow. How how did they do that? Mm. But Google's again a machine, so it's an AI, and it's easy to say, "Oh no, my uh, my cousin wrote that." <laughs> no, <laughs> machine I know wrote that, <laughs> so it knows it, and I don't know how it knows it. But people are starting to say, I, "I've even seen AIs that are building images now." Oh yeah, yeah, it's uh, mind blowing. Yeah, it is. Like, wow. Uh, but so Google doesn't want that. They want people that are experts, not machines that are experts. Mm. So they will eventually, people are going to jump on that like there's no tomorrow. And it's what's going to happen is Google will finally figure it out and it'll all get kicked to the side. So everybody that has those kind of businesses will end up mm. not, not, at least I'm hoping. Let's put it that way. Because <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't, I'm screwed. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I see it. Uh, you know, well, that was my first thought. I was like, okay, everybody's out of the job. And uh, and then then I, the, the more I've actually played with it, the more I see it as it, it can write and on the images side, the same, it creates amazing stuff with like very simple prompts. Like it, it's mind blowing, but you, the, the quality of those is nothing compared to what it can do when there's an expert feeding it information. Like I am not, for example, I'm like, I probably can, you know, count on one of my hands, the dishes I can cook. And that's it. Like the rest is like, usually if I say in the house, I'm going to cook and the kids are like, can we order pizza now? That, that's how bad it is. That's how bad it is. So if I try and produce an article using artificial intelligence about cooking, it's going to be nothing compared to if you do, because you know what to ask, you know how to ask it to improve stuff, you know what references to throw in and do you know what I mean? It, so I see it more used as enhancing yeah. Uh, accelerating like the and, and we started using it actually in our work as well when we do research when we do those type of content where you've done pretty much a lot of the work but like it helps you find out information quicker and you know do some summary or whatever or yeah it, it accelerates the the work but not replace right so yeah. I, I see it, it yeah accelerate and enhance that's mm. good 
that's always good when you can do something to make something better. Mm. But you're just pushing that article out like a machine and you're writing, you know, I, I look at, I got a website. So they had 10 blog posts today. I says, how the hell do they do that? That's how it happened to Chad GPT. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah and it's like, ah, oh. but you know, again, it's, it's, it's quantity versus quality. And mm. that isn't always the way to win quality over quantity will usually win in the long run, or at least has been up to this point. And I, again, mm. you're writing for people. Mm. So there's there's yeah. always going to be minds out there that don't want what I write because it's too human. They would mm. rather have just black and white, something that's just got all the information they need in it. It doesn't have to have any humanity in it whatsoever. Mm. Okay. There's always going to be those people. But I think in the long run, people, again, I, I mentioned people like people they they want to mm. want to be with someone they like they want to read something they like you know and that's the same thing with any business so mm. unless until and i'm not saying that's not going to happen those ais have really good personalities like did you see the, <laughs> the movie her or what it was it was where where the yeah <laughs> i wanted one of those right away <laughs> until they can do that you know, you, they're going to still go keep going to people until they can develop personalities. And at that point, they're sentient. So we're really not machines. Any, so. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting times. <laughs> I know. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I want to talk about food and, and we kind of like, a, yeah, let, let's talk about food a bit. So, yeah. So who is your, your blog for? Like what level does one have to be? What, what, tell me a bit more about that. You, you can know how to turn the stove on and I will help. <laughs> you. Okay. okay. <laughs> now there are people out there that no matter what you do or how you teach them, they're never going to like to cook. Okay. Mm. I, I've, I've worked with people like that. They can repeat repeat what you do. They can learn the process, but there's no joy. So mm. if there's no joy in it, if there's no uh, none of your soul into it, it's never going to be great. It's, it's going to be adequate at best, and they're never going to enjoy the time in it. So my blog will let you, let you, give you a place to start, but it'll also give you something that once you get comfortable, you know, this is what I try to teach people. The most important thing to do when you're deciding what to cook for dinner is to cook food that you like to eat. Mm. This is where the mistake comes in. People decide like, oh, I'm a horrible cook. I really need some help. Let me look on the internet. Oh, mm. look at this. That looks really good. I'll, I'll try, but I don't, it, look what it, it's got. It's got garlic in it. I don't like garlic. It's got broccoli in it. I don't like broccoli, but all right, this is what, this is how they said to make it. So I'm going to make it. <laughs> so you spend that, you get the, you get the ingredients. You spend that time in the kitchen making it. You follow the recipe. You're really doing good. You should be proud of yourself and you taste it. And it's like, I like it. <laughs> so right now, tomorrow, you're going to go, I think I'll order out. You're mm. not going to go back in the kitchen and make something again that you didn't like. Mm. And now all of a sudden, I don't like to cook. It's not that you don't like to cook. It's that you've been cooking the wrong thing. You've mm, been, I love that. Yeah. You've been believing that what I say is the gospel when it's not. It's it's a plan. It's it's a beginning. It's it's an outline. It's giving you a place to start. So when you mm. get one of my recipes, and I try to tell them in all my newer ones, Aaron, if you don't like broccoli, try spinach, try asparagus, try, you know, what other vegetable do you like? You know, if you don't like this seasoning, leave it out. It's okay. Mm. This is your dinner. Because what will happen is if you make it, all right, I'm going to leave this out. He said it was okay to do that. And I'm going to add some tarragon because I really like tarragon. And, and you'll sit down in the sauce and go, wow, this is really good. So guess mm. what? What am I going to make tomorrow? And then your kids will turn and go, when did you learn how to cook? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if you can find joy in the process, it will, first of all, if you can find joy in eating and the process that you did worked now, your number one, your confidence level is going to go up. Your happiness level goes up. So time in the kitchen isn't a chore as much as it's going mm. to be fun. And then now you start bringing the kids or your spouse in and let them help you a little and, and show them that it's fun. So when it becomes, because food is about, food is bonds us. Food is the, the biggest bonding tool we have. Mm. When I travel, my wife will wander off We'll be in a country we don't speak the language, and she'll be talking to people, and she doesn't know how to speak their language. <laughs> and the next thing you know, we're sitting in a table with them eating, you know, yeah. trying to converse as best we can because food is the great joiner. It's what brings us together. So you mm. can sit at a table full of strangers, and at the end of the meal, you're 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 friends with some of them or a lot of them because it's, yeah. So that's this whole 
thought process is what you bring into your home. You know, mm. should join what you do. And if it's like, I don't like to shop. Well, guess what? I use, we have this thing, Instacart in the United States where it's <laughs> ordered online and they bring it to me. I had an order this morning because I didn't yeah. feel like going to the store. Or there's all these meal kits. Okay, order some meal kits. It's all cut for you. It's all ready for you. All you got to do is put it together. So maybe mm. you're going to learn along the way how I tell you, well, they didn't send any ground mustard with this, but I like Dijon mustard. I'm going to add a teaspoon of that into the sauce. It's going to taste better. It's going to taste what you want it to be. It's your dinner. You should mm. never have to eat something you don't like mm. okay? or, or be told you should like it. I, I, I tell people, try it the way it's written if you want to, just to see how it should be. But if mm. it's going to really, if they're really not going to like it, well, then fine, leave it out. But I mean, because sometimes I develop a recipe and it's got ingredients in it that you might not really care for, but they do something else too. Like mm. I used to, people hated artichokes, but I used to use the liquid from the can and it would soften the flavor a little bit. Mm. You know, it's, it's just little things that you do. As long as you're not allergic to it, I might fool you. Mm. Like my wife, <laughs> eat beans. my wife hates beans. So when I make soup, I'll puree them. <laughs> and she, she never it. <laughs> and it thickens the soup. <laughs> Unfortunately, she read my blog one day and found out. Oh that's dear! Right. I was gonna say, you know, no, that's like she read your blog. If that was me, I'd be like, "Ha ha! You ate beans." I know. <laughs> Just no. after. <laughs> oh, she don't know. I'm not down. <laughs> Yeah, but again, as long as you're not allergic and there's something, you're not going to kill someone. You know, there's ways to add a flavor in. To, and, and then later on, like she hates Cajun seasoning. But when I make scallops, she loves it on. Mm. And I'll tell her, she goes, I don't like that. And I go, well, you liked it with the scallops. I did. I go, yeah, you did. <laughs> But again, yeah, that's uh, funny. Yeah, there's the in different combinations. There are things that that people like or don't like. So yeah, no, I, I love I, and we can probably like have a, a whole another episode of that podcast just talking about food and I, I'm like I, I mentioned already I'm really bad in the kitchen like the only few things that I can cook are and you kind of touched on that because you have to like it and, and well it helps that my husband cooks well so I'm like just leave it to him you know he can do it it's nice everybody's happy he's enjoying yeah. this stuff but the the few things that I can make are actually some kind of a nostalgic recipes that from my childhood that like I like and I remember liking when I was little. And those are the only few things that I can actually make well, which is revealing, I guess, to, to your point of you have to like what, what you're cooking yourself yeah. for, for it to you know happen. And, um, and also, yeah, I, I love the, the, the point on food, like literally one of my favorite, I have four kids. So like at the dinner table, we're like six people, mm -hmm. one of my favorite times, like, having dinner is literally you know people around the table it's a different kind of atmosphere different kind of conversation it's it's always I, I think I like the convenience of you know fast food and walking on the run and whatever but we we absolutely have lost something in that putting that time into cooking and putting the food on the table and sitting around as a, as a family or as friends or whatever so what you're doing in a way where because you know this was like um a slogan on your website, like cook a restaurant quality in your house. I, I think it's really on point with that, that you can actually have nice looking food because now it has to be on Instagram or it didn't happen <laughs> no, <I know>. at home. <laughs> I, well, and, and that's it, you know, and again, lo nice looking food. It's, it sounds like it's not something that should be important, but it really mm. is, you know, and my wife, oh, even now she goes, oh, do you need a paper towel to wipe off the plate? I'm, I'm home. But I'm still cleaning. <laughs> I'm still, you know, yeah. I have to clean the edge of the plate, you know, and if I don't have some chopped parsley ready to finish the, the just to add a little pop of color to the, to the dish. You know, I'm like, like last night I made shrimp scampi and I didn't have any parsley in the house and I was beside myself. I'm looking at <laughs> the house, the house plan going on. <laughs> I decided against it, but I'm like, yeah, and I'm going, mm. <laughs> but yeah, if it looks pretty, the first thing, because we eat with our eyes, that's the first thing we get it presented mm. like every now and then I'll get a meal at a restaurant and it'll come out and it'll be too beautiful to eat right away. Mm. So I turn it, I look at it. Of course I take pictures of it too, but I, and then I I'll smell it and then I'll taste it because mm. it's, it's like a, oh, it's a moving experience. When you get good food, it's like magical. You know, and again, mm -hmm. I, you know, I like fast food. I don't eat it very often anymore just because as you get older, your body just can't take that stuff mm -hmm. or, or it stays with you forever. One of the two. <laughs> uh, 
But, you know, and I'll never tell people, you guys, you know, I love making my own spaghetti sauce, but you, you don't have time or you don't want to. There's some good jarred sauces out there. So, you know, I'll have mm. a rest with the sauce. It says, yeah. if you don't want to, just a jar of your favorite. There's things I don't like to make. So I understand that. I don't like to make salad mm. dressings. I can make them. I don't like to. Mm. I like Catalina salad dressing. That's my favorite. It's probably terrible, but that's what I like. So I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I get the same brand I've been using for 50 years. So, okay. <laughs> but, you know, if you don't like doing it. My wife, on the other hand, loves my salad dressing. So I have to make them for her every now and then. Mm. So, she likes them. Uh, but it's it's a matter of using what you like, using what you're comfortable with, just learning some tricks to maybe adapt it a little bit. And that's, again, something I like to teach. It's like cooking isn't, it's, like, it's not rocket scientists. When I was teaching, <laughs> that was the phrase I used all the time with my girls. It was like, it's not rocket science. And, you know, and, <laughs> and was there, when they're teaching the younger ones, I'd hear them tell it to them too. It was like, oh, I'm so proud. <laughs> It's like a proud father, even, you know, not my kids, but it's like a proud father. She's learned well. <laughs> uh, you know, it's food. It's food. And I, I always would try to remind them that we are blessed to be able to play with food, making something mm. with people out there that don't have and to never forget that. You know, I've, mm, made, I've made my living with food. So I always, that's like my number one donation cause is always, you know, food for other people. Um, mm. But, you know, it, it's something you learn. And again, you find joy in, and then you express the joy and you share the joy. So that's what it comes down to in the kitchen is finding, finding the joy. I love it. Wonderful. Well, that's a, that's a brilliant ending to, to the podcast. Last thing, what's new this year? What are you looking forward to? What, what are you up to this 2023? Well, well, about middle of last year, I changed my philosophy on recipes. I was mm. always trying to be the consummate chef creating things, expanding the boundaries, pushing the limits. And I realized that no one knew what I was making. So Google didn't know, mm. number one. And I'd give it to people and they'd look at it. And unless they'd been with me for a while, they were like, oh, I can't do that. I can't make that mm. much. You know, I, I did a Kubiak of salmon. I, I had that on a cruise and I had never had it before. You know, it was, and it was like, oh my God, this is magical. So I had to make it. So I recreated it at home. It's like, Dennis, that was really a nice recipe. But how do I marinate, Sam? Mm. <laughs> you know, it's it's not, and I don't want to call it dumbing down because it's not, but it's it's understanding that not everybody thinks like you do. Mm. Not everybody can't take anything for granted. One of my mm. SEO guys told me, he says, Dennis, when you write, you have to write for a six-year-old or a drunk person. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> okay. If they don't understand it, you know, you're, you, you're missing, you know, there's so many people out there that aren't because that's a level of not intelligence, but understanding. Yeah. And it, We're talking about a very specific topic and I, I do completely get that, 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 uh, you, uh, I have that with domain names and, and naming. Like I could go off talking about something and then I stop a bit and I realize nobody has an idea of what you're talking about. But to you, it's so simple and clear. Yeah. Because that's what yeah. you do all the time. Yeah. 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 Or, or, you know, uh, some, and I have to change when I think about prep times because, all right, it took me five minutes to cut those vegetables. And my wife will sit there and watch me sometimes. She goes, I've never seen anybody cut so much stuff. And I've had other <laughs> people in restaurants tell me, she says, Oh my God, I've never seen anybody prepare so much stuff in such a short amount of time. <laughs> so if I say it takes five minutes, I figure no, my prep time is going to be like 10 to 15 minutes. All right. So <laughs> I'm one that doesn't necessarily have the skill or hasn't been doing it for a while. So again, mm -hmm. it's, it's thinking about your audience. So you asked me what was new. So what is new is, is going back to simple. Mm. Okay. I, I, I'm not a TV chef. I don't need to do these things. So let's go back to the basics. All right. So let's start making dishes that are simple and mm. I can show you how to adapt them. All right. Let's get your confidence level up in the kitchen. So this is my, for as, as long as I keep, can keep doing this, my goal is to help you help people learn how to eat better and not necessarily mm. nutrition wise, but how to eat tastier foods. You know, we want to mm. get some of that into it, but I didn't start eating organic till I started buying organic chicken because Chicken stopped tasting like chicken. Everything mm. else in the world tastes like chicken. Well, chicken didn't taste like chicken. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is horrible. What is it? You know, and they're huge pieces. So then I started buying organic and, oh, that, all right, that's a chicken. And then I found small farm. You know, that's a lot of that on the, in the internet uh, where I could order directly from small farm co-ops. Mm. So I'm getting chicken that's actually allowed to be a chicken. It's outside. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
it's eating all kinds of debris. Because um, the when, when that first came out with free range or free roaming, well, that meant there was a door on the barn. And if they mm. decided to go outside, they could. But it didn't mean that they were outside. So, you know, mm. pigs need to be able to be pigs. Uh, I saw this video and I was like, oh, I was so upset seeing how they were. Pigs are as smart mm. as dogs. Uh, yeah. You know, we, we've had a relationship with pigs. And that's people said that's why humanity grew. Because as mm. we traveled as nomadic tribes, pigs went with us. Mm. And we'd eat them. And they were happy because they were getting to be pigs. And they'd make more pigs. <laughs> and we'd eat them. And, they'd, and, and we grew. And everything worked well together. Well, somewhere along the line... We told the pigs, go look in that barn for a while. We'll take care of you. And we locked the barn and then we mm. stuffed as many pigs as we could into that barn. So they no longer had a life. And mm. So, you know, we, I was, uh, uh, just, we're going to run into an hour now, but I was, um, I'm, I'm, I eat fish. I don't eat meat for like eight years now, but that's a different story. But before, when I used to eat meat, and we were at my, in the Ukraine actually, in my birth town. A village and um, at my grandmother's house and she had chickens and she would like kill them to cook them yeah. and when I was little I obviously wasn't like looking at that happening so I was just eating the food and then when I was older I actually looked once and uh, the, like as you look at the chicken in the garden running around like it looks like chicken but then yeah. you you see the, the the actual chicken that goes for cooking and you compare that to the chickens that you buy in the shop Oh, and yeah. you're like, is that the same animal? <laughs> like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> it, it, you realize how bad it is. How it's just crazy the, yeah. how, how different it is and how like it, it's bred for all the wrong things in the life that animal had and, and just what it looks like. It, it, it's just, yeah, it, it makes a huge difference into how, how you see that. Oh, yeah. I mean, and it's a, this, everybody wants white meat. So the size, the chicken can't stand up. Mm. It's so top heavy. Yeah. From the breast getting so big so yeah. and, but the meat again it's like with with vegetables we would buy when you buy baby vegetables there seems to be so much flavor in these mm. smaller ones and you know someone told me says you know as it spreads and gets bigger the flavor just kind of gets distributed so it's got x amount of flavor mm. You know, maybe it'll pick up a little bit more along the travels but that's going to be the compactor it's going to be spread out so mm. it, that's the same thing with meat what we're doing we're, we're perverting our food supply we have mm. in in the name of feeding the masses, you know, we're actually, it's probably just about making more money. Mm. It's, it's better practices. Uh, we have changed our wheat supply. So many people have gluten intolerances now because mm. we have perverted the wheat. We have, we have changed it from 13 molecules or whatever it was to like 21 now. So everybody's allergic. We've grown so much soy. People have soy intolerance. Soy is in everything because it's cheap. You know, so. Mm. When we when we go to Europe, it's so much different. Mm. The quality of the food, the things you don't allow that they don't allow in Europe as opposed to the United States, where it's all about politicians turning their backs for something to, to go forward. And in the name of feeding the masses, you know, kind of. A mm. thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm in France, so yeah. But there, there are places also okay. that you can feel the difference. And I have like I had my mother visiting um, some time ago and, and she was. She was walking around the shop, like smelling vegetables. She's like, "Oh my god!" I like, I remember that smell. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. It's scary. and and what they looked like, you know, carrots weren't always orange, you know. Mm. And you buy a bag of multicolored carrots, and people are like freaked out. Or you see tomatoes that are brown or black, and you're going, "Oh my god!" You know, <laughs> it's not just red anymore. You know, it's like let's get back <laughs> to what what things used to be, and before someone decided to market market. The perfect mm. carrot, the perfect tomato. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's end on that. A perfect carrot, a perfect tomato. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. I'm sure our listeners will. Thank you for making the time. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me on today. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Smart Branding Podcast. Feel free to visit smartbranding.com for more information and reach out if you have any suggestions, questions, ideas, or just want to learn more about how a good domain name strategy can help you build a strong and successful brand. See you next time.